think we're on now. Hello everybody, we're live again and uh, this is Alex and Naomi, uh, uh, part of the infant feeding team at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford and welcome to our weekly session. We are doing an hour of uh, Ask the um, Infant Feeding Team questions and answers so um, hopefully if you've got any things that you're worried about then give us a shout. Um, uh, anything about feeding at all, so that's uh, if you're pregnant, if you are breastfeeding, newly breastfeeding, if you're breastfeeding a two-year-old, if you're um, giving bottles, uh, anything at all that you want to talk about, that's uh, what we're here for. So, ah, I can um, see people coming now. We've got little, yeah, we've <laughs> Yay, got little thank numbers you. of people, so that's really nice. <laughs> that's a thumbs up and, to the thumbs up. Um, what it's not for is for questions about the hospital visiting, about COVID-related questions, unless it's about breastfeeding and COVID. Uh, and um, things about scans and all of that stuff. Uh, your midwife can help you with those. The uh, Trust website you can look on and that will give you the right information. And also um, you can uh, get it, things like COVID information from the RCOG or our midwife sessions, which uh, Wendy Randall, our consultant midwife, will do uh, alternate uh, on Mondays. So save your questions up, but um, you know, don't ask questions about that because we may not be able to answer. We are midwives, but we don't work in every area, so we don't know the right, most up-to-date information all of the time. Um, we'll try, but we don't want to give you the wrong information. So uh, direct them elsewhere. So how's everybody's week been? It's been a bit of a funny four seasons <laughs> week, hasn't it? Uh, we've had snow and sun and rain and all sorts. So. Uh, we've survived it all and hope you have too. I hope you haven't had too, too bad a week. It's been not quite as busy in the hospital as it was, uh, which has been nice. It means that we can um, do other things uh, as well as look after mums on the wards. We can start tackling other things as well. So we're always trying to make things better for everybody uh, and that's what we're uh, trying to do constantly. So, um, you know, let us know how your experiences were as well, because that's really nice, you know, to let us know um, if it was helpful, some of the things that you've learned, and, uh, but also any questions that you've got as well would be great. So one of the things that we do do uh, when we have got time on the ward is that we try and chat to the mums and give them a quick sort of session on how to recognise if your baby's getting enough. So we thought we'd run that with you this week so you you won't be able to see it so well because it's going to be back to front for you but actually also i noticed we put a lovely, lovely knitted nappy on the back and it's fallen off already so i'm going to grab it <laughs> so um so we'll just quickly go through what we're doing just because you might find it helpful and uh it, you know particularly if you haven't had your baby but if it's early days you might also find that because i think one of the um things that most of the parents find is that they, they, not most of them, but we do have a lot of mums coming back still and what we're trying to work really, really hard on is to stop you coming back to hospital because, um, you know, you are, uh, you don't want to come back, you don't want to be coming back. I'm just going to put my seat down a bit because I think I'm a bit low, a bit um, high on I was to turn it round a tiny bit actually. Yeah. So also, um, we're in our office we're today. In our office we're today. normally the other side of here. I thought we'd do something <laughs> different but, uh, and I'm sitting next to an incredibly hot radiator so I <laughs> start sweating, that's why. I might get up and open another window if it's not too noisy. Um, but one of the things we worry about with mums going home is that they don't recognise what they should be doing when they have, um, when they get home and they then don't realise that they need to feed their babies more and they don't need to, rec they don't recognise when their baby's not quite getting enough food. So um, I think certainly with the sessions that we've been doing, and now I think we've done 51, haven't we? Is it a year next year? It's, in, it's next a year week. next week, year next yeah. Week. So we've, we've started missed started a few, so we're probably at the low, uh, upper 40s by now, because we've yeah. missed one or two. One or two, not, not many. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm apologising for my chair. I'm on a really squeaky chair. This <laughs> <laughs> is very last minute. We said, why are we moving in? And we, we're on, on our own in our office today. We share it with lots of other people normally, but no one else is here. So um, it was very, very last minute running around, so that's why we're a bit late as well. So what we're going to cover in this uh, session, it's only about 10, 10 minutes or so, is about building a relationship with your baby, skin to skin, breastfeeding, why do we hand express, how do you know if your baby's getting enough, and where to get help. And those are the things that are probably most important in you recognising whether your baby is um, getting enough food, and if it isn't, or you're worried about your baby, um, what do you do and where do you go for that? Do you want to talk about that one, Alex? Yeah, I was just going to say, obviously, don't don't hold back on your questions just because we're talking. Um, I can see we've got two two comments come through already, so if you've got questions, just put them through and we will get round to them. So don't hold back. We'll be right so, so, 
if you've if you've been one of the people who's been on the wards when we've been talking, yeah. this is one of the pictures that we show. And I know the writing's going to be back to front, but what we're showing here is a picture of a brain. So it's a you know obviously it's a, um, a drawing of a brain, lovely and colourful. And the reason for that is that it's reminding you that if you're pregnant. Um, or if you've already had your baby, every interaction you have with your baby is important. So when you're pregnant, it's thinking about being aware of when your baby's moving, maybe rubbing your tummy, talking to your baby when you're aware of it, singing to your baby. You know, from very early on, babies can hear, so they become really used to your voice. So if you keep chatting to your baby and being aware of them, and you're making contact, you're beginning to bond with that baby already before it's even arrived. And once your baby is here, your voice is terrifically important important as well as your touch and the warmth of you and the smell of you so this is all really really important for your baby from a point of view of brain development so you know it's not just that you're looking after your baby you're building your brain's um, baby's brain you're bathing it in oxytocin which is a feel-good hormone um, and this is what leads to attached and happy babies who become attached and happy toddlers who become well-adjusted adults so we're not just talking about airy fairy stuff we're talking about stuff that will have an impact on your baby lifelong so well-attached individuals are the ones who can cope with those knocks and you know issues that happen in life because they've got a really good sound base so being in contact with your baby before they're even born, spending as much time in contact, you know, loving, cuddling, stroking your baby when they are born is all going to be contributing to that. And it's remembering that babies can't self-soothe. That's our role as the parent. It's your role to be there to cuddle your baby, calm them down. And sometimes they will cry even when they're in your arms, but that's what they need. They need to know you're there and that they can rely on you. And then you know, thinking about that they can't be overfed. So a breastfed baby cannot be overfed and a baby will feed for so many reasons, not just food. Not just a better food. Yeah, it? exactly. So when you talk to people, mothers who are breastfeeding, we say it should be a minimum of eight feeds in 24 hours. And some mums will say, well, it's more than that. And there's a lovely saying on UNICEF that says, you know, their website that says, I feed my baby for comfort. The nutrition sorts itself out. And that's very much the case that if you are you know, meeting your baby's needs with feeding with regard to putting them to the breast when they need that closeness and comfort, actually usually the nutrition sorts itself out, but you're giving that baby that sort of constant contact that they're looking for, checking in with you, knowing that you're there meeting their needs so that they can trust you and they carry on, it's that trust that they're building. Um, um, and that you can't spoil a baby. So, you know, in I think we live in a culture in Britain where it's thought that babies should be left to sleep in beds or in cots and they need to learn to fall asleep on their own. And we're going to say, no, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And research has shown from a brain development point of view, meeting a baby's needs, understanding that they do want to go to sleep on you because they know they're safe, that they do want to be in your arms, and maybe using a sling to meet those needs is actually the best thing you could be doing for your baby's brain development going forward. And that contact and that those attachment and to add to that i think you know when you put your baby down in a cot it cries doesn't it and the cry that it has is a very cortisol cry because it when you put your baby down it doesn't know when you're coming back mm. you know you're just going to the loo or you're going to make a cup of tea but or your baby doesn't opening know. the door but your baby doesn't know that so it's in the cot and it doesn't know if you're coming back or not and so they have this really high stress uh, level of crying often when when you put them down and separate them and and you know when when they're taken from you and put put away when they've been skin to skin they do cry and that's a very particular cry that you hear so um you will tune into your baby over the mm. over the years you know and, and you'll recognize what they're saying and they you know they don't manipulate you they can't do that at this age their brain's not wired to do that so they can't they can't make a rod for your back if you you won't make a rod for your back if you pick your baby up and spoil it. It's not going to manipulate you in any way at this stage. They haven't got the brain capacity to do they it. They can't do it. No, so It's just um, what they need. Keep them with you. It's where they expect mm. to be. Um, so a little bit about that then is the skin to skin, which is part of um, cuddling your baby. And the reasons we encourage you to do skin to skin is, is for lots and lots of different things. But um, it's what, it, partly it's where your baby expects to be, well nearly all of it is where your baby expects to be when it's been born. It, it wants to be by you, it wants to hear your heartbeat still because it's heard that all the way through your pregnancy. Um, and so it recognises that with your breathing and your heartbeat and your smell that that's who you are. And so your baby is very driven by smell and so it recognises um, who you are through that. But also it, it recognises the smell in the very early days, the amniotic fluid in, in the baby's 
hands when it's born um, smells like the nipples. So they know to crawl skin to skin to your breast to feed. That's the first thing they have um, survival instinct to crawl up and to suckle and they follow that smell to your nipples which smell the areola um, secrete in the um, little uh, little um, ducts around in your areola not in your nipple they they have like a particular sort of scent and uh, they recognize that smell and they crawl towards it so that's why we want babies skin to skin and why we don't wash babies down when they've been um, born so that they smell the same and they recognize all of those things we dry them off and make sure they're nice and warm and snug with you but the, the uh, skin to skin that you get so that the um, you, you passing your body warmth to your baby will keep your baby warm and if your baby's hot uh, it will keep it cooler when it's uncomfortable as well so it balances the temperature out very very carefully um, and also it um, it can uh, regulate breathing and it passes on your bacterial um, bacteria from your skin to its own body so that it learns to get um, protection from infections and things like that and it starts to it starts to um, socialize to external bacteria and external bugs and that's the starting process but not only that the skin to skin in the very early days is the thing that primes milk so it primes your milk production and also it um, will allow your baby to, to develop the health for the rest of its life so it determines how healthy your baby's going to be for the rest of its life on how much you expose it to your bacteria and your skin and your um, er your environment that you have will uh, predetermine your baby's health for life with, with good breastfeeding. So giving early breastfeeds. And, and it doesn't have to be if you're um, choosing not to breastfeed. It's still important that you do that so you pass that bacteria onto your baby to protect it lifelong. It's like having a bubble, isn't it? It's like yeah. because you, you and COVID. whoever you live with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, slightly different bubble. Um, yeah, slightly. But, but you and, mate and your partner will share the same skin flora because obviously, you know, at times you're skin to skin. Um, and that's what's happening with your baby. And you're giving your baby the same skin flora. So my skin flora will be totally different to Naomi's, even though we spend lots of time together. Um, but uh, it will be different. So, you know, it's thinking that your skin flora um, then colonates your baby and protects yeah. your baby from someone else's skin flora so yeah. you know if you've had skin to skin and then maybe someone comes in to do a set of obs on your baby in the hospital and you know, that's when they're going to check their heart rate for instance and they touch your baby well they their the their skin flora won't have a look in even if they haven't they haven't got gloves on because your baby's already, already colonated with your skin flora which is what we want and so also where we encourage little you know very few people handling your baby yeah. in the early days because you just want the main carers in their life to be passing on the bacteria to yeah. to their baby to protect them for life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, don't hand them around. Don't get lots of different people to feed your baby. I don't think anyone's got a chance you know, to hand around no, baby at the moment. Nice thought. <laughs> and don't forget that it's much more than that. It does calm a baby. You know, yeah. everybody loves skin to skin. And I say that all the time, that that's why everyone gets pregnant. We still like skin to skin <laughs> as adults. So um, it doesn't ever go away. It's really important. So. Um, just think about that in the early days, you know, that w that's where your baby expects to be when it's born and, and you keep doing it even after the early days. Oh yeah. Go to it as the first thing that you do if your baby hurts itself, if it, you know, falls over, if, if you've got a toddler, you know, they just love that comfort and skin to skin if they're poorly. So it's, it's managing, managing that for the rest of your life really with your baby and, you know, everybody loves it. So um, <laughs> it's not just, for, not just at the birth, it's for it all the mm. time and it's really, really good for milk production. If you go on a breastfeeding course, um, like we've done in the past, um, every answer it will be correct if you say skin to skin. They want other answers too, but skin to skin is always the answer, the first answer that you can give yeah. to any breastfeeding problem is start with skin to skin and then move on. But I'm just aware there are questions coming through and we promise we will get through to them. I can see a bit of a theme on them today as well. Okay. So we do talk about positioning and attachment, but we'll probably talk about that as the day as the session goes on. So yeah. we could we could have a little break now and do something, and then you know if somebody asks some positioning and attachment yeah. questions, we can uh, go through those and teach that as well yeah. and at the same time. If that's better, if they're all backing up. So I've had a few, and I can just say they can see there's a bit of a theme coming. So Jessica's put here. She's got mastitis. She's been on antibiotics since Tuesday night. Her nipples very sore when feeding, and blistering on, on the openings. Is this normal? So I think this goes back to positioning attachment, just making sure what's going on, whether the blistering is mechanical or not. So is it something to do with how your baby's going to the breast, Jessica? And we know that mastitis, with sort of two forms of mastitis really, if you've got damage on the nipple, um, 
then it's possible to have an ascending infection, so an infection that comes through any damage on the nipple. If you hadn't had damage on the nipple previously, then it could be just what we call non-infective mastitis. So that's mastitis where milk has gone out of the ductal system into the tissue around the ducts, and the body behaves as if it's an infection because it says, well, this milk shouldn't be here, it shouldn't be in this tissue, because it should have been in the ducts. And the body behaves in exactly the same way, whether it's a bacterial infection or a non-infective um, infection. So, the question is really why have you got the damage? Is this to do, you know, is this contributed to the mastitis? So we, again, we would be looking at positioning and attachment just to make sure it's not a mechanical reason. And obviously the antibiotics are now going to help. They are very useful. They're really, really good anti-inflammatories um, and they will bring the inflammation down regardless of whether it's a bacterial or a non-infective mastitis. So that links into the position. Links position beautifully to making sure that you line your baby up in the first place in the right position. So it's about and we use these pictures a lot, but actually, you know, you're lining your baby up much further um, across underneath your breast than you think. So see where your baby's chin is. It's right underneath the breast there and the nose is at the nipple, not the mouth at the nipple. So you want the baby much further around than you think you need to get it so that you line your baby up in that position so that when the head is free, which is where you should have your baby, um, um, you should uh, then, the baby should be allowed to lift their head back when they go onto the breast. So starting there, you can see, yeah. So, yeah, and then they tip their head back. So then they tip their head back and they look like that. So you've gone from lining your baby up perfectly on the breast there, and then your baby's head is tipping back, and they do that naturally. They need to extend their head back. Think about when you have a glass of water. You yes. extend your head back to do it. And when they extend their head back, the tongue comes out. So they look bleh, like that. And that then enables the nipple to go over the tongue, right to the top of the back of the roof of the mouth. And they will play out their, their reflexes that they need to attach to the breast really well. So if you centralize your baby and put it on, on a, to, a, to the breast like a bottle, they won't play any of those um, behaviors out. And so the, the tongue doesn't come down and um, they don't extend their neck back so that the nipple goes up to the top of the roof of the mouth, which is really, really, really important that they get that. I'm dropping everything now. <laughs> and that's another picture of the same. So you're making sure that that nipple skims the top gum and goes right to the top of the back of the roof of the mouth. The nose is really far away and the chin is close. So it's and starting there, isn't it? If that's yeah. the nipple, so it'll be there, then the goes back. If that, we do it with that, so it goes there to there to on. So we have a chin mnemonic C, hold your baby close, H, head back and free. Your bod baby's body is in line, so if you show the shoulder, the ear, the shoulder, the elbows, the hips, the knees, and the feet are all in the same line. So okay. your baby shouldn't be like that feeding. You don't want a baby facing. Right, it needs to be in line, so it's all straight, all the way along and the nose is opposite the nipple. So make sure that you get that, um, if you get that sort of mnemonic in your head, chin, then you can think about um, your baby being in the right position in order to attach at the breast properly. And then you take your baby close up to the breast and this gets a really big mouthful. So you can't, oops, you can't see, getting in the tizzle here, you can't <laughs> see any breast tissue around nipple and areola hardly round the baby's mouth. If you can see your baby's mouth going like that, uh, or you can see the areola and the nipple being pulled in and out, it's probably not far enough on the breast and that's where you're possibly not quite far enough on. So just make sure that you work really, really hard on that attachment in order to get a really deep latch because one of the reasons that you get mastitis is that your baby's not drawing the milk out of the breast as well. It's damaging the nipple to create a, a, a portal for infection, but it's also not draining the milk out of the breast, so you get this backlog in the ducts and it creates inflammation. So if you get a deeper latch and you get really good uh, removal of milk, then the mastitis doesn't happen. So it's, it's normally always about um, getting a poor latch. Occasionally mastitis is because you've had a bit of a longer sleep. Mm -hmm or you've had a bra that doesn't fit quite well. If you have a longer sleep, it's sometimes because your breast is not drained as quickly and it just mm. tips it very quickly and you get nasty mastitis doing that with no warning. Um, it could be that you're sleeping on your breast really heavily and it just stops the flow of um, milk and so that causes a bit of a blockage as well. But also be very wary when you, can I just borrow that breast? Mm. When you're breastfeeding uh, with mastitis, 
when you're getting mastitis, do you hold your breast and go like that and squeeze your breast like that because you're sore? Because that can blocking. block it up. If you do that eight times a day, you're going to create a, a blockage in your ducts which will stop flow of milk and that is sometimes all it needs as well. So just think very carefully about how your positioning and attachment is but also what you're doing with your hand and how's your bra, is it the right size, is it a wide bra, um, is, it, is it tight because sometimes that can create problems and has your baby missed a feed that it's just slept a bit longer because that sometimes happens as well. If none of the nipple, if you haven't got nipple soreness or anything like that, and your baby should come off spontaneously when it's fed, and it should not have a different shaped nipple. That's really important. The nipple should be slightly longer, but the same shape when Absolutely. it comes out, um, and not damaged. And those are the signs of good attachment. So make sure that you sort of follow those rules. And if you're not sure, play this session back and have another look and listen to what we're saying. I hope so. that helps you with that. Yeah, good luck, Jessica. It's not it's much. Not it's, nice. it's you really feel not absolutely nice. terrible with mastitis. You feel like you've been run over by a bus. I know. Um, Charlotte's come on. She's our frequent flyer points lady <laughs> with her daughter Alicia. Says so that Alicia is waving at the screen, so we'll wave, wave yeah, at Alicia. Hello, Alicia. She's got more teeth coming, um, and she's getting better <laughs> at eating chunky soon. food. Well done, her. Yeah. I think she's going to be our talisman. Keeping she's been us going, all going, keeping us. Yeah. Um, so Jessica, who we've just been talking about the mastitis, she's saying that her Lizzie is five months. How do I go about starting to wean and feed? How many how many feeds is normal at this stage? So breastfeeding doesn't really change. All you're going to do is add in other foods because remember that food before one is just for fun. So at this point in time, right up to her first birthday, the most important food that she can have is your milk. Um, so sorry, that's our bleep going off. <laughs> Can't Put stop it. In the it. Door so you can hear it. <laughs> it didn't um, work. <laughs> So the most important thing is still going to be milk uh, right up to the age of one. Um, so as a result, um, you know, what you're wanting to do is just try her with other foods. It's just learning about complementary foods. I would suggest that you go and have a look at um, first steps in nutrition because they do a whole section on complementary foods. Not only foods that you can buy, but foods that you can make um, and talking about it on there. So it's a really, really good website. We use it for anything to do with formula milks as well because it's a very good resource. It's evidence-based, um, non-biased. It's an extremely fabulous resource. So mm. first steps nutrition, literally as it sounds. If you do a search for that, it comes up with a pair. Uh, the the lo logo is a pair. Um, have a look on that. Um, the Public Health England and the sort of the leaflets that we use, these off to the best start ones, they a also whole series of them. Yeah, they know. also have a compliment introducing solid foods, which we have a few of here actually. And um, if you go and do a search online, you'll be able to find yeah, them. Yeah, they'll be on a um, PDF. So that's quite good as well. So yep. you can go and have a peek and have a look at introducing solid foods. Mm. Um, so there's this one as well. So first step nutrition and this, and there's so many ways of going about it. I mean, some people choose to go the very pureed route. Um, but now that we're weaning babies at six months old, that's much less needed. When when we had our children, yeah. we were weaning at you know, twelve weeks. Yeah, I know, so early. Now oh, now we know we wouldn't do that. So we know so much more. But now because babies are weaning at you know going on to solid foods months. at six months, they can cope with those lumpier, bumpier foods. You know, they don't need purees. They can cope with finger feedings. There's lots of stuff out there about finger feeding and you know sort of doing it like that. So baby led weaning. So there's lots out there for you. And you that's don't have to I'm... do it on a certain date. No. You know, you've got to look at your baby if it's not quite ready to do it at six months. You can leave it a tiny little bit longer. You can try it and go back to it. Um, you know, it's around about six months, but you know, we do encourage exclusivity up to that time because we know that babies don't have things like digestive um, enzymes in their mm. tummy until then, so they can't digest food well until about six months old. When well, they we were giving it. our babies baby rice at the age of three months, and now we've, yeah. uh, we've both learned that they don't have any amylase in their tummies. Yeah, they can't, they can't, digest actually, can't actually digest it, so it just filled their tummies with something they couldn't digest. So, yeah. you know, it's... You know, yeah. it's it, we certainly have learned a lot more about it yeah. these days. We're much better about it. But, um, so see how you get on with that. And as, as Naomi says, there's no time scale on it. There's no hurry. So, uh, so quite exciting though to go on. To and make sure you put a rainbow of colours down so yeah. that they get used to lots of different colours and textures. You know, mm. nothing, nothing bland, nothing beige to eat, <laughs> because you know they want to be stimulated mm. visually as well as. Um, sensory wise, mm. taste wise, so um, make it as exciting as you can. And we're going into a fantastic time of year with lots of lovely things available to eat. So um, 
you know, it's a nice time to start weaning a baby in the next month or two, isn't it? Lovely. Uh, moving on to Agnieszka, she says, Hello, first want to thank you for all your support. I'd like to ask you ladies about how to start to use a bottle. I'm breastfeeding my six-week-old girl. She's healthy and feed, feeding, feeding perfectly, but I'm, at some point I'll need my partner to feed her too. Um, I got, let me move down so I can see it, all oh, breast pump, but don't know where to start. What's the rules? No rules, that's a starting point. No rules at all. So it's thinking about... You might find that expressing after your first yeah, feed yeah, of yeah. the morning is a good time to express because that's when most mothers have more milk than they need. Um, later in the day, it tends to get a little bit more difficult to get milk off, so you might want to start thinking about expressing at that time in the morning. It's a good time. Were you going to do... I was just going to do bottle some feed? responsive bottle feeding, okay. you know, because so, remember, if you haven't done this, your baby may not be very happy about it. So it, it might be, you know, minimise the number of people that give a bottle. But if your partner is going to be the one that does it, then perhaps they should be the one that does it the first time you do it as well. Just because they won't, the baby won't smell your milk and um, you won't be quite so stressed if you're worried about doing it. A lot of people get very stressed because they have to go back to work and they've never given anything other than the breast and so it's quite you know it is quite difficult but um, hold your baby close um, and um, make sure that they're sitting slightly upright but close to you um, and then um, try a few different teats you you know your baby will be very different and it and if you used a bottle at the very beginning it might be that it's the wrong teat for your baby now so um, slide I'm going to sneeze <laughs> <laughs> right mid chat I'm going to sneeze so put the baby in, uh, put the baby, put the bottle sort of horizontally so that it's not upright like that. Because we know that if you hold the bottle up high, the flow drip, 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 and it's it's very stressful for babies. And you see babies that get a lot of food, they look away from from the source. So they look away from the bottle, they look away from the, the parent that's feeding or the person feeding if it's too fast. So you know, look at what your baby's doing when you're doing it as well, and see if they're actually enjoying what you're doing. Run the uh, teeth down the top lip so that they then open their mouth and gape they put their tongue out and then they can give them the um, tea to take it into their mouth and put it you know into the mouth to the back of the roof of the mouth so that their stimulation is in the same place as a nipple the, st the stimulation for suckling starts much closer to the gum at the top on the palate um, and they will start to suck much sooner than the actual good place to feed so if you just put it in at the front they will suck and it'll go in and out and in and out and they won't actually you know, um, use their tongue effectively to feed. So you want to make sure you put it in far enough into their mouth and then you hold it horizontally and obviously you tip it up slightly as they, um, as they get uh, the bottle emptier. So um, watch the feed and let them pace it. Let them take what they want and they will spit the nipple, the teat out when they've had enough rather than overriding it and filling it um, fast into their mouths, which is very stressful and they, they, they often overfeed or overfed. So um, if you've ever pumped, you know, think about uh, how much you get out when you pump and just think, well, that's probably about, you know, if your baby has a, a 30 minute rest feed, we don't look at times particularly, mm -hmm. but if it takes 30 minutes to pump and your baby has a normally has about a 30 minute feed, it's probably going to be about what you, you would pump out in volume. So it might be that I, I'm not going to give volumes because every baby is different shape, size and everything else. But, you know, if you, if you have pumped, and you're going to express breast milk, however long it takes and how how level long you breastfeed for, think about the volume that you get. It's probably about what your baby will get at the breast, so you could offer that sort of volume if you're not sure. Um, if you are giving a bottle, don't give all of it all at once of express breast milk. You know, put a little bit in a bottle and yeah. then feed your baby and then add to it because once they've suckled on this bottle, you have to throw everything out if they don't take it. So if you've defrosted milk, and um, they haven't taken it or you have to throw it away which is just desperate when you've pumped and if you don't have huge amounts of milk that's just soul destroying so always add to it rather than giving the whole bottle to your baby otherwise you you have to throw it out and we're going into the summertime now so you know it's much warmer as well so bottles you don't leave bottles lying around they get bacteria growing in them although we know breast milk probably doesn't grow uh, large volumes of bacteria but it's best practice is that after an hour your milk is not ready to be used again and, and if your baby's put saliva into it you shouldn't be using it again after an hour uh, because of uh, the bacteria in your baby's mouth so uh, make sure that you practice safely and uh, you don't make your baby vulnerable uh, by uh, using milk that's been out, out for a long time so we say six hours for express breast milk on uh, the side and then in the fridge for five days 
but um, just make sure if you've used the bottle you, you dispose of it after an hour. So don't waste milk by giving the whole bottle. If you've got 100 mils and your baby takes 20, that's a lot of milk thrown out. Um, and uh, you know, if, if your partner gives them a, the milk in a bottle, it might be that they take it more readily. Yeah, I was going to suggest the same thing. Mm. Um, you know, for that reason. We've actually put some videos up now on our web page. So if yeah. you go to OUH, the hospital, maternity and feeding, so literally go, if you put in the search, OUH, maternity feeding, you'll see there's a link to some videos that we've done. We're not going to win any Oscars for them. We keep telling people this, but, but they do get the information across. And there is one about bottle feeding yeah. and another one about expressing using a pump, which is both of us, I think, again. Um, but you'll see some of the others from the team as well, because there's Elisa and Hannah on some of the videos. So, um, so it might be worth having a look at that and certainly when it comes to if your partner's going to be giving the bottle that he sees how it's done because you know I think in the press in the media we tend to see babies that are flat bottles up and those babies will be overfed we say you can't overfeed a breastfed baby but you can overfeed a baby with a bottle and so we want to try and protect your baby from that yeah. because it's not it's not very nice for them so it might be worth having a look at those videos so Agnieszka I, I hope that goes all right so think about maybe pumping first thing in the morning when you're likely to have the most milk if that's what you want to do um, pumping is you know, be hands on, hold your pump kit on with your hands, don't hold the bottle, and you'll see that all on the video. Um, and you know, just to be guided by the flow, so and we'll talk you through all of that as well. Um, and then, as Naomi says, try your partner to give the bottle because it might be more successful than you. Um, right, and don't forget you can hand express as well. You don't, yeah, if you haven't got a pump, pump. Just she has got a pump, she said. One, you can hand express, and, um, and that's very effective as well. Lucy's put a message up, and I think I was meant to be ringing Lucy back, actually. Lucy might have called, actually. <laughs> so we haven't got round to it yet, because it's clear now. Um, so she saw us a couple of weeks ago, and thank you for, um, for the help. Uh, she's had a couple of questions. So I suggested that she expressed and feed Sylvie with a bottle, but she won't take a bottle. Is there anything you can suggest? How old is she? Uh, I can't remember how old she is, I have to say, off the top of my head. Bit. I'm worried... Um, Oh no, well I know because she says later on, very handy, thank you Lucy. Uh, she's worried about her supply, um, because can she increase it by pumping even at seven weeks? Yes you can, and we know that the biggest impact you can have on your milk supply is in those first two weeks. We go on and on and on about it, I know you do. Um, you can really lay those foundations down, mm -hmm. but you can still make a difference. So it is worth trying um, pumping. Um, and I know people are getting messages about pumping a half an hour after a feed or an hour after a feed or straight after a feed. I think the thing is to think sometime after the feed and not too close to the next feed, yeah. but not be too strict. Because I know some women, women say, oh, I can't wait the half an hour because I've got other things to do or an hour after is too difficult. So if it suits you to do it straight after the feed, just do it straight after the feed. Um, so it's whenever you can fit it in, but it's you know, closer to, the, to that feed than the next one, really. Um, thinking about how to get her to take a bottle Maybe you, I don't know if you already tried this, and you probably have, but your partner tries it. You, just you, like we yeah. Said. yeah, you know, having mimicking breastfeeding in close, like Naomi's just demonstrated, upright, bottle horizontal, so your baby can control the flow, because that's quite frightening. Because when they're breastfeeding, they control the flow, and if the milk's pouring in their mouths, they can't control it. So you know, thinking about what Naomi's just said. Try different teats as yeah. well. Don't always go just go for yeah. one. Um, and don't be fooled by the ones that are closest to breast because they're all teats at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, nothing's not, like a breast. They're not breasts, none no. of them. So don't don't yeah. spend a lot of money on a, a fancy teat that uh, it says it's the closest to a breastfeed. It's not. Mm. So, um, you know, they're all the same. They all deliver milk from a bottle. So um, just, just try a couple and see how you get on because it might be that one suits and another doesn't. Uh, and remember that they do take a couple of feeds to learn how to manage the teat in their mouth. It's a very different action to a breast. So they, they throw it around their tongue and underneath and side to side for quite a <laughs> bit. And there's sort of a lot of open mouth and teat showing where they're just learning, thinking, what on earth is this, you know? Mm. And then they suddenly get it and they'll start. Mm. If you've got flow and there's milk going into their mouth, they learn that that's milk and that they like milk and they'll suckle. But, um, you know, it, it, uh, it's dependent on the baby but do remember that the flow is very different so if you're routinely going to start giving bottles that um, it may get uh, flow it may your baby may get a bit flow confused if you give lots of bottles and then they get cross at the breast as well because the flow is delivered differently in a bottle it's the same all the way through the feed to the end and at the breast it's a fast flow at the beginning when your breast is fuller and as the feed goes on it gets less and less and less so babies often get really cross at the breast 
towards the end of it if they've been getting lots and lots of bottles. And you can overcome that with a bit of compression. So you're, you're taking a big handful of breast and you're compressing your breast as far back to your chest wall as you can go. Um, you can do it that way, you can do it that way, you can do it that way, it, whatever suits you. Um, but you can deliver milk more quickly into your baby's mouth. So as the flow slows down, you can just make the sucking a bit better for them by giving them more flow and that will help. But just bear that in mind when you're putting a teat in. They don't tend to get teat confused. It's normally always flow confusion when they get bottles. But um, you know, some people have to give bottles and, and, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, but just be warned that some babies get a bit cross if they're used to getting bottles and then they go back to the breast, they get cross. So you've got to sort of um, mix and match with that yeah. and make sure that they get plenty of flow and make sure you protect the milk in your breasts if, if you've got lots of milk. Uh, you know, you probably won't notice so much, but if you've got slightly lower supply, the baby will notice when they start getting bottles compared to the breastfeed. I think the part of getting used to the, taking a bottle is maybe not trying when she's desperately hungry. Yeah. So, uh, you know, try when she's, you know, catch her when she's just waking up, see what she does, or um, after you've already given, you know, so she's already had a fair bit of milk. So, but uh, we'll see how we get on. And I think, I think they do just... Some babies you know. are like ducks to water. They don't care what goes in and others just, you know, they just... They know run. where they like it from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll tell you what they want. Right. So hopefully, Lucy, we can catch up with you. Yeah. Um, Katie has come on. Hi, ladies. I'm 37 weeks. I started trying to express colostrum ready for a little stash at home. I'm doing everything I did first time round to express after my boy was born. I didn't get to express before as he was early. Nothing is coming out yet. Is this normal? Do I just need to be patient? Yes. Just keep being patient. Don't worry about it. Rate, which we also do on our no. session. We teach mums with our little... Um, thing on how to hand express as well so we can go through that and just make sure you're doing it absolutely tip top because sometimes it's technique and there's plenty there don't be alarmed if there isn't because there doesn't have to be but um, just make sure that you, you're comfortable you're unobserved you're not cold um, massage your breasts a little bit so that you get that flow going um, think nice baby think about your baby moving around inside you because yeah. that just focuses you on your hormones and your baby and that sort of baby moon and then make a C with your finger and your thumb. So you're looking at like a pincer, think of like a, a crab or a lobster, you know, pinch, pinch, pinch. It's that sort of um, action. It's not that, which is what a lot of people do. They rub their finger across with the thumb. You want to be actually delivering your pressure into the ducts rather than rubbing them. So uh, you go two to three centimeters behind the uh, base of your nipple and push back slightly and then with that pinching action, you just pinch into your ducts and hold for about four seconds and release it and then push back. And imagine that your finger and your thumb are going together inside your breast so that you're putting those together. You're not rubbing like that. You don't want to see that, you want to see that. And that's the technique that gets the milk out. If you're rubbing with your finger, like that, if you're doing this rubbing action, so you're, you can see that I'm rubbing my finger and rubbing, it doesn't work in the same way. It's like, that's like rolling, rolling paper, you know, yes. it's, it's, not, it's not effective. Uh, and you'll get sore. And you will get sore, you'll get bruised. So you want to be sort of pinching. It's that, you don't have to hurt yourself, it shouldn't hurt, but it's that action. You think that it's much deeper than you think you need to go and then hold it. And you will find if you go around the breast like a clock face, you'll find your little sweet spots where there is colostrum and you'll just keep going. So it's about learning that technique that gets the milk out. It's not about making it at this stage when you're, when you're still pregnant, it's about the technique. If you collect it, that's a bonus. And if you're, you know your baby's going to need some, that's an incredible bonus. Um, but it's about the skill so that you can do it when you've had your baby and you're not learning something new. And as you, you know, you, you've got nothing else going on as far as babies are and you're struggling. So imagine if you had a baby and you were trying to learn, it's much harder. So it's always very good to learn how to hand express before you have your baby, but don't necessarily have to collect. Katie's more. posted again, actually, and she's just said it's three years since she did it. And she thinks maybe she'll have another go and thinks it might be. She might. It's nearly she'll have always go technique. Evening. Think about being, you know, maybe hop in the shower before you do it, Katie. Yeah. You know, go have a nice warm shower and then try and yeah. see how you yeah. get on. So. Um, and that will help. So, um, so have a little look and you can collect it in a little pot. So um, you, can, you can have a little clean pot, soapy water, you can use ice cubes, 
Uh, you can uh, have a teaspoon to collect it on. You don't need to have syringes, but you can get one more syringes from your uh, midwives when you see them, and they can give you some to collect as well. So um, have a go, see how you get on, and if you're not sure, go back to your midwives when you go to the next uh, appointment and ask them to check that you're doing it okay. They're all very used to doing that, so don't be embarrassed about um, you know, asking about hand expression when you're pregnant because um, they work with babies and mums afterwards as well. Just to say, we've said this so many times, don't bring lots of colostrum in, no. in with you. And if you bring it in, be prepared to keep it with you. Don't hand it over. Bring it in a cool box with um, ice blocks because we've had another incident this week of it being put in a fridge. And the problem is, when you, if you go through the system here, you're going to meet lots of different people mm -hmm. and someone will put it in a freezer and that message doesn't get put over where it went. So yeah. hang on to it. Bring it in a cool box. Bring, don't bring very much. You might have to get your partner or a family member to go and get more if you need it. But just bring in the barest minimum and try and keep it frozen because it, um, we just can't keep track of it. It's just and too express when you're in labour, I would say. So yeah. do it while you're waiting to have your baby in the early stages. You'll get lots out because there's hormones flying everywhere. Mm. Um, and, you know, it might just tip you into longer, you know, yeah. quicker labour. Because if uh, you're coming in, you're thinking about you're coming in for an induction, you'll be on level six. And then when you go down to have your baby, you're going to be on level two. And then you might be on level two on the delivery suite, and you might have to go to observation area. So that's another area. And then you'll end up on level five, which is a postnatal ward. And this is why we... Four different areas. This is why we lose it, and, and shift changes and things. Mm -hmm. So so please hang on to your milk. Keep it in a cool bag with ice blocks. It will be fine for a good few hours. It only needs to be used within 24 hours of being... De uh, sorry, 12 hours of being defrosted. So, you know, so, so if you think your yeah. labour's not progressing, you know, send it home. Yeah. <laughs> and they can always come back with it, yeah. but it's probably better not even. Or to get bring someone it in. to write down where they've put it, so everybody knows yeah. where it is. But, but um, okay. you know, it's much safer in your own home than coming in. So get them to bring it back when you've had your baby, and do some hand expressing in labour, and you can keep that for twenty four yeah. hours, uh, and that hopefully will see you through to the early days, and and then your partner can get it, yeah. collect some more and bring it in uh, the next time they come. We've tried to address it and we just can't make a difference. So. There's too many people here in too many different places, so um, it's human error. Yeah. Right. Okay, so we've got another message. That's, um, Sarah's come on and she says she's got mastitis, she's struggling to feed her baby. What should I do? I've seen the GP, but I'm currently struggling with the pain when feeding. It's keeping that milk moving. I don't know if your GP's given you some antibiotics, which they may have done. Um, if they haven't, and you can take ibuprofen, that would be the first line care. Mm. Um, and it's a case of moving the breath, moving the milk. So mastitis can resolve almost as quickly as it can start, as long as you get that milk moving. So get your baby on well, and that's the key thing. Get your baby on in a really good position, just as Naomi's described. Um, and and if need be, also do some hand expressing or pumping um, to keep the milk moving in the breast because once the milk starts moving, that's when mastitis is resolved. So I think we've covered quite a lot about it. I said there was a theme. I'd seen there's a few couple about mastitis. So Sarah, see how you get on um, and you can always call us for some support too. Um, and we can talk you through it. Regular, yeah. regular ibuprofen. Even yeah. if you don't feel you need it, you don't it feel just, feverish or sore. It will bring that information Three times down. a day, 400 milligrams three times a day and take it for a good few days. Don't just stop if you start, suddenly feel better because it's like, it's like an anti-inflammatory even when you're not feeling unwell, it helps to clear those ducts. And um, you know, pump, pump, pump as well. If, if your baby's not feeding, quite often you get it when your baby's just fed, and uh, it hits you, and your baby's not hungry. So you know, have have a way of getting the milk out of your breast to drain it, because that sometimes takes the symptoms away. And if it comes back with a fever again, it's probably infected. If it goes, if your breast fills up, uh, and you don't get a fever back, it's probably non-infected mastitis. But, um, you know, it, it is just draining, as Alex said, it's taking everything away so that um, the inflammation is removed, or the thing that's causing the inflammation is removed. Right, we're going to move on to Samantha. She said she came to see us with her little Elizabeth, and she's now seven weeks. Um, yeah. It's particularly unsettled, has lots of hiccups and sick lots too, sometimes straight after feeds, sometimes later, 20 to 30 minutes, and it's curdled then too. Mm -hmm. She also feeds a lot, and a lot is in capitals, spends most of the day. Um, attached is there something I can do to help so um, is it effective feeding that you're doing and do you have lots of milk I can't remember Sam whether you had lots and lots of milk or not um, and um, 
you know, is, is it just if the feed's very quick and then they get really full and then a bit windy and then they burp and what, what they bring up um, that's on top of that wind will come up with the feed. So they just bring up whatever's on top of that wind. Um, so if they burp immediately after a feed and they vomit a little bit, so it, I mean, a milk goes a long way. So when you see it come out, it looks like it's the whole feed, but it's very unlikely to be the whole feed. Um, but it, and it does make a mess, but it's often just whatever is on top of that wind that they bring up. And obviously if it's curdled, then it's digested milk by the time it comes up. So it's just a bit thicker and a bit changed. But, um, you know, babies don't have a valve on their tummy. So the, the base of their, um, uh, or the top of their tummy, it doesn't close like it does for us. So when, um, you know, when babies burp, they just, anything that's in, in the way will come up with it. Yeah. And that means if you pull your baby's feet up to change its nappy after a feed, milk will come out of its yeah. mouth. And <laughs> just the like same, you know, they do that, or you tip, you know, you tip them over sideways. It, it does come out their mouth because there's nothing to stop it coming out of their tummy, um, and that resolves as they get a bit older. But they, you know, so babies that are very sicky and they're crawling around, it's because they, you know, haven't got that um, control when they they get. Um, some babies do it more than others, but it, it's not abnormal unless your baby's unwell or it's not reaching its milestones. Mm. So is it peeing and pooing appropriately? Is it gaining its milestones in the weight on the centiles? Um, you know, so is there anything that's worrying you about that? I mean, for us, it doesn't sound alarming. It sounds like a normal baby. And it may be that your baby's just a bit of a piggy and, and is really guzzling. <laughs> You know and enjoying the milk and that sometimes happens if oh, you've lovely. got lots of milk and sure. they just really guzzle um it's it sounds normal um yeah what was the other question you said about so talk about it being curdled is there anything yeah. else you can do to help i think and and, and, and we will always say and i know you're that you're upright for a bit yeah but it, you know it's also just thinking samantha you know i know you've been to cs but you know, it's just re revisiting positioning and attachment. And one of the things we find as the babies get older, and I had this conversation in clinic this morning, is we need to allow for those babies to get older. So you might start, have we got two, have we got a small one and a big one? Have we got small a little one, baby? Big one. No, no, we've we got a little baby. So, so if you think about how you're holding the little baby, they're going to be sort of just bang slap in front of you. And as the baby gets bigger, they've got to come round you. The mm. head is going to stay in exactly the same place it's the body that comes around. But what we often find when we're dealing with mothers with older babies is that baby's getting placed in almost the same, they've been put across, so they're central, which that's not, that's not what we want. We want that head back here and the body they coming around. They have to grow around. with you. And they, ha they literally, they will wrap themselves around you. So you make sure you've allowed for your baby to get bigger, because that's what we often see. And I think also you can sort of do big boy or big girl feeding, which that's is sort of been a question we've got here actually. Is how sitting, do we do bigger feed, feeding so the older sitting babies? Sitting them up a little bit more, so yeah. you can sit them on your lap and let um, me just move the camera a bit. Yeah, sit them, sit them on your lap. You Excuse might my hand. You, um, that you put your foot on a put your foot on a book or on a stool or something, and then your foot's elevated slightly, so your knees slightly higher, and you sort of hold them sitting up a little bit, and they can see then because you know babies that are close like this can't see what's going on and they're so nosy babies they want to know what's going on when they realize there's something outside of mummy in the world you know and so they do like to be able to see so you might find feeding is better sitting up like that and you sort of what we call big boy feeding um uh, where they're just sort of sitting on your knee a little bit more and helping themselves they can sort of see what they're doing and you know their mouth is bigger and your breasts are used to being uh, suckled by that stage uh, so you know you're a bit more adaptive with it um, so that that's one way of doing it the other way is to do um, this feeding so they can just sort of sit with you laid back so you're holding your baby to put it on and its head will bob we've got all these pictures in clinic we should have brought them up shouldn't we uh, and uh, they can sit facing you and then when they're on you can just pop their head to one side and they can just turn and see what's going on and they like fiddling they like to, you know, they like to touch things when they're doing that. And I had a mother at this morning with the most yeah. beautiful necklace, actually, and that's exactly what it was for. It was a nice chunky wooden necklace, and there are people who sell them, and it was a chunky wooden necklace because when you've got a baby that's got yeah. that bit older, they like to, to have something to hold on to, yeah. and so they, she had this lovely necklace that this baby could then yeah. play with. Yeah. So, um, if you've got hair in the way, they'll do that too. Oh, yeah. Have hands full. In the, yeah. You know, we wake up and they've got hands full of hair. <laughs> Where does that come from? Mm. So, you know, those are two positions that you can use, which are a bit easier for older babies as well. 
um, they've got a bit more control, they're a bit more solid at that stage, and you're a bit, and less, up, and up, a bit right, less worried of them. And this is upright, it stops yeah. them from positing often, they burp while yeah. they're feeding, and that's quite helpful too. So think about different positions uh, to see Ooh, Good luck with that, you. Samantha. It should yeah, be getting better. I spoke to two mums this morning and said those first weeks are the hardest, it does yeah. get better. Yeah. Jessica's come back and said her baby's five months, actually quite big now. Any suggestions for older baby positions? I thought I'd seen the questions about that. Exactly, so, um, it is. Yeah, so there you go, some older but baby certainly positions. Certainly sitting and, and hugging them is always a good way, because at five months she's probably nosy as anything, isn't she, and rubber neck, <laughs> so your nipple will be pulled in all sorts of directions at that age, where they just want to know what's happening when they hear a noise. Um, and they will go back to feeding again, and sometimes at about five months you have to go into a dark room and turn everything off, you know, no radio, no television, Curtains shut. Thank, thank really you, calm. passes. <laughs> it passes, but it's sometimes you can't feed your baby with any distractions for a few weeks, and you, and, you know, it's quite distressing for some mums. So, um, you know, it's not unusual to have that at that, that five months that you're struggling again, but it passes. Right, Charlotte's come back and told us that Alicia's now on purees and she's had chunky foods as well. And she just wanted to thank the Chipping Norton midwife to think, oh, that's really lovely. She's such, she's real cheerleader on the sidelines is our lovely um, Charlotte and Alicia. Thank you for that. Kelly has said her 10 week old has quite bad reflux and is breastfed. He started becoming fussy not long after interfeeds and he's now dropped a centile on the weight charts. I'm worried that he's due to, it's due to his fussing as he doesn't want to work for the hind milk along with his reflux. Um, do you have any advice? My GP has currently advised a bottle of formula in the morning and night. Um, well, not if you're breastfeeding. No, do I agree? N no, not if breastfeeding is going well. There's no reason, no indication to offer formula. Um, that's not necessarily going to make anything better. If it's reflux, then if they were going to do anything, they're perhaps thinking about um, Gavascon, wouldn't it be? So, but not, not. I mean, if breastfeeding otherwise is going well, sitting upright and feeding is always a good uh, way mm. of coping with reflux. Um, you know, is the attachment absolutely brilliant? We could look at the suckling and swallowing because that's part of uh, what we do mm -hmm. you know the suckling and swallowing pattern that we expect the baby to do and um you know some babies will do a feed and do all of this pattern so they start with the sort of frilly 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 bit at the beginning and then they go into a long deep suck and then they pause and then deep suck and they pause and deep suck and deep suck and then they go right to the very end now that pattern could be five minutes or it could be 40 minutes and your baby will get what they need in that time. And some people worry if their baby's taking it in five minutes that they're not feeding well and they're trying to feed more so they give them more food and they don't actually need it if they've gone through that pattern. So listen for the suckling and swallowing and they should sort of suck and swallow every other feed. So that, you know, it, it just sometimes is, is that pattern happening when your baby's feeding? Are they getting the right feed? to drain your breast properly? Are they doing that pattern when they're feeding and coming off spontaneously in that time so that they are um, getting the whole feed? And are you offering the other breast? I know with reflux they get very full sometimes. Uh, are you giving less often feed? So feeding more frequently with less volume sometimes helps. So you feed a bit more frequently but not large, large feed. Sometimes that helps because they don't have to tolerate such large volumes. Um, how old was your baby? Is it five? He's ten weeks. Ten weeks. He's yeah, ten so weeks. He's not doing any sitting up or anything yet. Um, I mean, obviously the GP is suggesting formula because of the weight gain, um, but, but you need to look at that pattern. If they're drawing the milk and getting the hind milk, that's the important thing. Um, We're going to hear the helicopter land yeah, now. Yeah, having everything today, <laughs> aren't we? <laughs> Don't the life of an for feeding this drive. <laughs> Our office <laughs> overlooks the helipad. The new helipad, yeah. <laughs> So it's about once a day we get the helicopters landing. It's been busy this week. <laughs> uh, but yes, I think that uh, can you pump a little bit and, and give your own milk rather than, ex um, than formula because um, actually breast milk's got more calories in it than formula. So, um, you know, it's, it's as good. And if you sort of pump it a little bit at a time, if you're not getting large volumes, you haven't got much time, take bits off during the day mm. and collect it so you've got some in the evenings to give your baby. But actually you need to look at whether your baby's doing the right suckling. Mm. Is it on the breast correctly? Is the attachment right? Because all of those things can cause reflux-like symptoms if your baby's not quite on the breast far enough. Um, and also if you're getting lots and lots and lots of uh, formula, so uh, your baby's on off, on off the breast and not draining the breast well, 
they will get what we call lactose lactase imbalance and they'll get a lot of um, the lactose that's in the breast milk, uh, the lactase in the baby's tummy can't break it down so they get um, the byproduct of that is that they get very gassy mm -hmm. and they get this fizzy gassy um, byproduct in their tummy which is normal but if, if, the, if the lactose is sitting around and not digested properly because the lactose can't like the lactase, the enzyme can't digest it, it does create this backlog of fizz which creates this reflux and symptoms. Uh, and also your baby's unhappy and uh, uncomfortable and it could be that uh, you know they're not draining the breast and getting the fatty food to put on the extra few calories that they need. So don't don't necessarily use dripped breast milk if you're if you're struggling with weight, you know, you could probably drain the and pump after a feed to see if you can get sort of more fatty breast milk uh, rather than drip breast milk if you're using something like a hacker which you stick on your breast on one side while you're feeding on the other. Just make sure you when you're pumping that you get more milk out. I think, you know, it might be a good idea to either talk to your midwife, to your health visitor at ten weeks and there is an enhanced a uh, health visitor team, which they may be able to get someone to come and watch what you're doing to make feeding better for you. Um, we're very happy to take calls from you, but unfortunately yeah. we can't see you in our clinic. Um, but we could talk to you individually. We don't want to go into too much detail about your personal situation yeah. on life. So I think, I think first and foremost Forum. it would be thinking about giving your own milk, doing frequent, slightly more frequent feeds, because yeah. um, the baby might volume, tolerate less, yeah. if, if uh, reflux really is a problem, then maybe discussing gaps bomb with your GP, um, which you would. What that does is solidifies your milk, so they don't bring it up so much. Yeah. So it depends on what's happening with the baby. Yeah. But it'd be, I think it's worth definitely worth yeah. getting so hold with your positioning that makes them unhappy, rather than a problem. You know, you want to see why your baby's not happy with feeding. Um, I'm going to move this on. I'm afraid. Uh, it was Kelly. It was Kelly. Oh, is that the same? Yeah. Or oh, should you put another bit on? Um, desperate to continue breastfeeding. I just don't think Alfie wants to wait around for the milk full of calories. I'm just not... So if, he, if he's going on well, from what Naomi's just said, he will get those calories. And it, you know, it's not going to be a case of sitting around waiting. It's because he's efficient at the breast. Yeah. So There's some compressions that will push more in as well. If, if he's, you know, if he's impatient, give him a bit more um, from deep within your breast, and that will help as well. He'll, he'll suckle more. Uh, and you'll be sure that he's getting enough. It, we don't know when it starts and when it finishes, which is why we don't talk about hind milk and full milk very much, because we don't know when it is and when it isn't. Um, it's very individual, and, and if the baby's on the breast properly, they will get the right amount of milk at the right amount of time for them. Uh, so, you know, that's why we don't time feeds, it's why we don't talk about um, full milk and hind milk, because we don't know when it happens. And it's not an exact science, and it makes people really paranoid about whether their babies are getting the fat or not. It might be that they're not able to remove milk well enough or they're bringing up a bit too much posset and it's just sort of slightly out of balance. But it might okay. be worth talking to the Enhanced Health Vista practitioner to see if they can support you. So ask your health visitor about it and she can put you in touch with the one, the health visitors that support with breastfeeding in their, in their um, group of, of health visitors and they can perhaps see you and get to the bottom of why you're struggling. So Kelly, and, and she said that she's giving, she has been giving bottles of express milk, so she wonders if the baby's got used to a faster flow from the bottle. Um, but this is all stuff that, that you can be supported with. Yeah. And if your baby's unwell, you can use compressions as well to increase the flow at the breast. Things And babies love to be breastfed, as mentioned earlier. There's much more than just food transfer. So, you know, it, it, don't, you know don't underestimate what an amazing job you're doing. It's fantastic. And, and keep going as best you can. And also look at their stools, so look at their nappies, you know, they have their changing stools, so, you know, early days we're talking about here as well, but, you know, babies that are getting milk beyond day four, they should have yellow poos until they're six weeks old every day, at least two, and then after that they poo a bit less often, but they should still be nice yellow seedy poos, even if they don't poo every day, they should be nice and seedy. But if your baby's in the early days, and we're looking at the pooing, it's the same. You're looking at what's coming out as much as what's going in and if it's not coming out it's probably not enough going in either so it's really important to keep an eye on everything that your baby's doing is it doing enough wheeze so you know early days it should be peeing on day one one pee day two two etc up to day five it should be doing about six to eight by then um in 24 hours so make sure that you're looking at what your baby's doing and if it's not doing those things it's not got a changed stool by day four if it's still black poo on day four or if it's not pooed on day three at all 
and you're now on day oh, four and so haven't seen one, please phone someone and tell them that they have a food and you want to be seen because they will have start, lost weight. Start by day hand five. expressing. We've had quite a run of babies coming back in with quite big weight losses. And if you know that your baby should have a yellow poo on day four, um, then you're less likely to come back in again. So those of you that are expecting babies, please, please, lodge it in your brain. Your baby don't needs... Think I don't want to bother anyone because it's a much it's more really important for you if you need to come back in. You're back in, you're back in for 48 hours and that's not what you want. It's yeah. much better that you call someone up yeah. and say, my baby hasn't got yellow stools or yeah. my baby hasn't had a poo because breastfed babies do not get constipated. If they're not, if they're not pooing, they haven't had enough milk. It's as simple as that. So if that's the situation that you find yourself in, call the midwives and get more help and start expressing straight away. Um, and don't let any of them say to you that it's normal that babies don't poo every day because they do. Early days babies should be pooing every day. Yeah. So if there's no poo between day two and four, you should be really, really on that phone first thing on the fourth day morning and getting someone to watch you breastfeed. And you know, if there's no poo on day three, you should be thinking about pumping at home being you know sort of proactive yourself or hand expressing and getting access to a pump and talking to your midwife about getting a pump so you can see what's going on and, and have extra food for your baby so that you can just put those sandbags out before the tsunami you yeah, know, just absolutely. stop the flood before it happens so keep your milk supply going get your baby keep your baby feeding yeah, i'm going to move us on it because it's half past, it's gone half past three. Oh uh, so Rose has said she suffered from really low supply with her daughter in 2019 and had a terrible, very short breastfeeding journey. I'm sad I didn't know about the infant feeding team back then. We're sad you didn't know about us because mm. we were here too. Um, and I've contacted you this time at 36 weeks and been advised to express posturum, which I can't believe I've managed to do. Well done. See, you've it's, got the skill. Yeah, it's very pale in colour and almost runny. Good. Is this still going to be as beneficial for my baby compared to brighter yellow colostrum? It's absolutely irrelevant what it looks like. There is such a spectrum of colours. And very often when mums, and you may have noticed, are expressing from the nipple, there are about nine nipple pores where the milk will come out. They can be different colours from different Sometimes pores. Sometimes they could be orange in one yeah. and white in another. And clear in another. So don't worry, whatever you're producing is totally and utterly perfect for your baby. It is tailor-made, yeah, bespoke for your baby. We do not rate your colostrum by the colour of it at all. It sounds fantastic and well done you. And I'll mm. feed that back to Hannah because I suspect you had a conversation with Hannah on the phone because she's doing all our antenatal calls at the moment. Fantastic so, uh, work. So absolutely brilliant. Well done you. Mm. Um, so yes, cherish that colostrum. Don't bring it all in. Don't bring it all in. <laughs> That's keep... your take home message today. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Please don't bring it all in. Um, so good luck with that. Well done, Rose. Right, put a bit more. She's nearly 41 weeks. Well, you'll be having that baby mm, soon. Get <laughs> expressing. It might get you in the right direction. Yeah, fantastic. Sarah came back and said thank you for our messages earlier. Um, Samantha said she was initially worried about the milk supply. She seems re gaining really well, burps really well. It isn't always... When she burps, she only, only poos every three to four days. Ah, oh, but she's 10 weeks, so we're not worried about six that. six weeks, we don't, don't worry. Don't worry, that's normal, yeah. very, very normal. Yeah. After six weeks, babies really slow down on the pooing. Um, so that's really normal. Leanne has come on. I spent a lot of time with Leanne last week. And she said, hi, ladies. Lyra has started putting weight on steadily. Yay! Yay. And she's also spending a lot longer at the breast and is much more content after a breastfeed. I'm still following the feeding plan and she's getting a 50 mil top up. Our three alley feeds are still taking a long time, but things are going in the right direction. My... Oops, oops, I've got a screw shooting up. My Ardo pump was delivered today, so we'll be using that from now on. I'd like to attend one of your clinics. How can I book? Um, how can I book on? Give us a shout. Email or um, yeah. telephone. Yeah, and... Um, Self-refer. Yeah, just give us... Leave a, a message on the answer phone or email us and we'll, you know, we'll get tell you us in. what time yeah. is a good time to call you. Yeah, so um, that's fantastic because it was only this time last week I was spending all this time with you. In fact, it was a Friday thing. And everyone yeah. can self-refer. We triage you. So some, some of you don't need to see us if we triage and talk to you. Um, and actually, it's, it's very important that you know where to get help. And the, the first, first place that you go to for help is your midwife. And that, that's, that's in the early days. Your midwife will support you and breastfeed, uh, give you breastfeeding support. And if she's not offering it, ask for it. 
um, you know, make sure you go to your appointments with a hungry baby, so you need to, to feed your baby when you're with them at the appointment. Uh, and also things like um, Oxfordshire Breastfeeding Support, they're in the background as well. They are very busy because they're not live uh, face to face at the moment, they're just doing Zoom. And they're also specialist uh, uh, lactation consultants, uh, so they're very experienced. And La Leche League is also incredibly supportive uh, and doing telephone consultations, baby cafes, and also your health visitor is, you know, that's the next level from your um, midwife. Uh, so that you, you know, we see mums up to six weeks in our clinic and then after that the health visitors take over. So I think so. the thing to say about that is that if you are struggling with feeding and you know you've got an appointment with the midwives, I would ring them in advance and say, please yep. can you make time to give me a help with feeding. Yep. So because I know that a lot of appointments are taking place in units rather than coming to you. Yep. Um, so just give them the heads up because you know if, if they don't know that you're having problems, they won't know to allow you the time. So make sure you tell them in advance so that they give you the time yep. to help with feeding. Also their appointment to yeah. suit you. So, you know, because that's what they are there to do it. Yep. And, you know, our colleagues are really keen to help you breastfeed and to realise what your goals, what, you know, what yep. goals you've set yourself. So they want you to succeed as well. So just, you know, make sure that you give them a heads up. So if you're turning up for a, a five day appointment and it's a heel prick and a, maybe, a, you know, if you've had a section, you're having a stitch removed, give them a heads up, tell them in advance, phone them in the morning and go, by the way, I really need help with feeding today. Um, and let's see what they can do for you. And they will move heaven and earth to try and help you as best they can. So, uh, right, I've seen lots of stuff coming as a flurry at the end here. <laughs> so, Charlotte's come back. So she's trying really hard to do tummy time with Alicia and tempt her to crawl. <laughs> we had this conversation the other day. Charlotte's trying to get her daughter to move on to the keep next stage. Her, keep her on her tummy. <laughs> you don't want her to move. Oh, she's a... Uh, She's talking about her teething and waking. So, <laughs> oh, it's lovely. Kelly's come back. Thank you so much, ladies. And Lucy has come back. Thank you. Samantha's come back saying she's seven weeks. Poo has been the same three to four days since about um, three three to four in days since three to four weeks. But if that's three or four, three to four in a day, that would be fine. Already so. three to four days since she's three weeks old. Yeah. A little bit unusual, but she's she's doing okay. You say just yeah, not very did, happy. Yeah. So, um, you know, just talk to us if you need to. Okay. Um, Leanne's come back and said, thank you, so Leanne, you're going to give us a call. And Rose has come back as well. So I think we're there. So, uh, lots, so, uh, of lo lots of lovely questions. Yeah. And, you know, it's surprising, isn't it? We do this little pr presentation uh, to support staff when we can, and we've got other um, members of staff doing it. And uh, you ask all those questions, and we're just weaving it in through the questions because it's the things that matter mm. that you're asking about the things that you're asking about the things that bring you back into hospital that bring you back to see us because you're not quite right you haven't quite got things sorted your milk supply is a bit low and sometimes it's the early days that cause those problems so it's about um understanding those and managing it and being really proactive as parents that's important and not sitting there and looking and looking and looking and then at six weeks panicking and ringing us you know just get on it get on it and talk to us so if you haven't had enough of us you can go on and go onto the <laughs> OUH website so go literally type in as I mentioned earlier go OUH and then maternity and um, feeding literally put that in as a, as a search and up comes our feeding page and you'll see that it has, it has a link, um, I think it's called the maternity series, and it tells you there's a whole load of videos, and there is videos about how do you know your baby's getting enough milk, everything we've covered, how to hand express, and there's a lovely video, one of our fantastic mums let us film her, um, there's how to use a pump, um, bottle feeding and alternative feeding methods, and skin to skin, um, skin, to skin and relationship, um, responsiveness and relationship building. So it, go and have a look at that because that will answer a lot of the questions that you've already asked today and hopefully that yeah. will help. But yeah. Um, yeah, anyway, so last flurry coming in again. Let's just finish sneaking that. In yeah, sneaking in, in, sneaking in. So we've got Charlotte who's just come back. She's thinking of having another baby next year. Um, <laughs> we'll see and you then. Congratulations. And Kerry, so thank you ladies. I watch in the background every each week and, I, and for the moment, this is so helpful and informative. Thank Good. you. Thank you, Kerry. 
We but, love uh, doing it. Yeah, we do enjoy doing it. Mm. And I would say they're not slick. Our videos are not slick at all, but they will give you the information. So you have to, over, you know, look over all our little ums and ahs and uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> put up with it. But it we're does not quite give you as the good at doing a face uh, face in a camera as, as we've got used not, to sitting chatting.